which only wants a resistance farm, an agroforestry and permaculture demonstration farm. My name is Michelle Tryon. I am a 63-year-old Lakota woman, wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, who is a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe. I am located on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in the district of Porcupine. I've been homesteading my land since 2009. I live on 165 acres of land that me and my siblings inherited from my mother. Three of us have homes there. Four, six generations that I can trace back. My family have always lived here in Lakota territory, what we call treaty land, unceded and ceded treaty lands of 1851 and 1868. Now it's referred to as the state of South Dakota. My people have always been hunters and gatherers. I am only the second generation that grew food by farming. My grandmother, who is from Porcupine, also had gardens and livestock like horses. Here's a picture of my parents and my grandparents at Porcupine, South Dakota. Badlands and the Black Hills. A Lakota creation story tells us the Lakota have always been here. We came from the lower lands of the Black Hills a place called Wind Cave, and that the ecosystem and the buffalo have always lived in balance with us. Until the 1800s, when the buffalo were slaughtered and the Lakota were forced onto reservations. South Dakota's leading industry is agriculture. They also lead in genetically engineered varieties of corn and soybean, GMOs. They have 15 ethanol plants, in the state and they produce over 1 billion gallons a year and produce 10% of the nation's ethanol. Ag is big here, you get my drift. In the past, the climate and bad agricultural practices caused the Midwest to become a dust bowl and have the worst economic disaster in history. Hopefully in the future, it won't happen again. Incorporating agroforestry and permaculture principles will help heal the land and save water. South Dakota during the dust bowl, one of South Dakota's black blizzards of 1934. This is approximately 140 miles from where I live. Agroforestry and permaculture are new methods of growing crops on the reservation. Where I live at Porcupine, South Dakota, it is sloped and forested. It is also rocky and the climate is windy with hail, snow and rain. We are building a regenerative agroforestry and permaculture demonstration farm. It is very small scale, and we are still learning and implementing agroforestry and permaculture principles. Regeneration. The terrain at Wichone Wash Day Resistance Farm is not exactly farmland. I feel that if I am able to grow food and trees on my land, then I can teach other elders to grow food just about anywhere. I come from the poorest county in the United States, so it's imperative for us to be food sovereign. The Oglala Sioux Tribe Vocational Rehabilitation Program has assisted us because my husband and I are both disabled. We have worked with other entities in the past, like South Dakota State University Extension Workers, Agribility, USDA and Running Strong. However, it is a hassle to get our roads fixed or to get housing from our tribe. And we do most of the work around our place. If we can regenerate this land and be sustainable, then we feel we are successful. Sunrise and fog rolling in over Porcupine, South Dakota. Clouds above Windy Hill. Sunrise at Windy Hill. The climate has always been a challenge for us living on Windy Hill. Clouds as the sun is setting are beautiful. Clouds are forming above us. Sunrise again. It took me a while to get used to living on a hill and living so close to the clouds, but I'm used to it now. Home of Wichoni Wash Day Resistance Farm. It sits at 3,400 feet above sea level. 
Mount Whitney is four miles south and Keely Radio Station is three miles away. I'm standing on the hill behind my house. Clouds over the house are very close to us. We never know if they are going to produce hail or just wind and rain. I took this picture at the road. The weather makes us evacuate when it gets bad. It gets very windy. One time my roof got blown off from a previous storm and it moved my house to where it sits now. So I get scared and leave. This is how our crops looked after that storm. All our food was ruined. Other farmers lost their crops from that storm cloud. By now we were getting frustrated with losing our crops because it is hard work growing food on a hill. This picture was taken in 2009 when I first moved up to Windy Hill, which is what I call my hill. This is our Inipi, our sweat lodge. This garden after we planted it, we made it a terraced garden so the water would not run off. This is the East Garden that was planted in 2012. Randy Strong gave us some organic conditioner for our plant and it grew good. Grandpa Steve picking weeds. We planted 10 trees around the perimeter in 2009. This picture was taken in 2013. That triangle is one of the trees we planted. My granddaughter's picking weeds in the West Garden. My granddaughter and son preparing to plant potatoes, squash, and beets. West Garden is all downhill. The gardens grew good some years and others not. We started using cardboard in our rows to prevent weeds. My grandchildren bring their horses over sometimes from Anderson where they keep them at my brother-in-law's place. Their manure is good compost, so we don't mind. Some years we had a good harvest, but we continued to lose our crops because of the climate. We started to think about growing food another way. Here are some vegetables we grew. We added different plants every year just to try them. I like radishes, so I planted black radishes. Squash and beets and cucumbers. Snap peas and squash. Here you can see the soil and how rocky and dry it is. A couple of cottonwoods we planted 10 years ago. They make good shade. We planted a couple of them from seed. The other ones were transplanted from Anderson, South Dakota. Our meeting was South Dakota State University, extension workers and agribility, collaborating with them on how they could assist us with our 2019 SARE project. We are focusing on environmental sustainability and social sustainability. We are learning more about soil conservation in erosion prone areas, how to grow better on a slope, also drip irrigation, composting and mulching, improving soil sustainability, improving organic matter, reducing soil erosion and improving better water holding capacity in our garden plots. We are planting more windbreaks and more terraces to reduce erosion, and we will be implementing more agroforestry and permaculture techniques, such as swales and raised beds to reduce erosion, to move soil moisture to where we want it to go instead of it just washing away our soils during heavy rains and snow melt. It was March 2019, we had a bomb cyclone and it flooded after the snow melted, except up here the water just runs downhill. We didn't plant until July because we were a little behind. We get a lot of snow sometimes until May. Our road, everything runs downhill and after it rains, it gets washed out. We have about a mile and a half to walk the road if we have to and we walked many times. This is soil sample done in the west and east garden. The nitrogen level for my west and east garden is medium. The phosphorus level is at a low level. The potassium level is at a high level. 
the soluble salts are low, the organic matter is low, and it is beneficial to add peat moss or something similar to help the organic matter. The rocky landscape I live on needs better drainage. It's very dry because of the climate. It needs better water holding capacity. This inspired us to try the sheet mulching system, drip irrigation, swales, raised beds in our plots. In the background, you can see the berries terraced on the side of the hill growing a second year. Also, it's the shrubs second year. Alkaline soil is clay soil with a high pH. So it has poor soil structure, low infiltration capacity with a hard calcareous layer. It don't have much nutrients. Granddaughter taking down old cover on homemade low tunnel. I'm transplanting choke cherries from my dad's house that he planted 55 years ago. Just my son and grandson planting trees as part of a windbreak. The trees will catch water as it runs downhill. Chance planting trees on the north side of the yard for a windbreak. Planting trees on the west side of the yard, 15 of them as a windbreak. Here I am transplanting trees. There's some volunteers to help me. They never did any gardening ever. It is important to try and have volunteers. We were lucky to have them the days we got them to help us. I ended up having surgery on my rotator cuff and I need it on the other one now. Here I am walking with a group of volunteers. I'm giving them a tour of our yard and showing them where we will be planting trees and shrubs, etc. I am explaining my project and explaining agroforestry and permaculture principles as I understand it before we do our hands-on training. These are young people from an urban area. Young volunteers listening to me about the work we are going to be doing today. Clearing the ground to make terrace low tunnels, swales and stairs. Here's the steps to my house, they're very steep. Here's my friend, the Robin, having a bite to eat. My granddaughter picking weeds one year. Another reason we put mulch down is to keep the weeds from growing. Here's the volunteers building the rail to the steps. Putting garden cloths down to prevent weeds from growing. There's some volunteers when we have them. There's our stairs with mulch on them. Woodpecker watching us. Four basic stages of sheet mulching are clearing the area, laying down your newspaper, your cardboard, gunny sacks, etc., compost, and your mulch. Here's a couple of extension workers from SDSU helping us with the mulch system. Sheet mulching will provide nutrients to the soil by breaking down to compost. It prevents soil erosion and it prevents weeds and holds water better. Putting down the final layer. Volunteers attempting to put up low tunnels. Me and Steve had to build them over and reinforce them. The wind tore them up. They are made out of PVC pipes and plastic. Here's Steve watering after planting. The low tunnels lasted all summer and the food was protected by the covers. Here we are after a long day. Here's the semi that brought my high tunnel. I thought it was going to tip over. Bring the ground and making it level. Patrick putting up the size to the high tunnel. Also echinacea growing wild. STSU and volunteers. Here's Patrick with volunteers from the organization called Remember. They come from all over the United States. 
that it took. We started installing a drip irrigation system, which allows us to use less water and direct it to where we want it to go. In the spring, we will install it to the entire farm. A drip irrigation system is a low drip that goes directly to the roots and it will save water and nutrients. It will also save us time and energy. It took a lot of water to water the trees and plants by holes. And with a drip system, we will have a timer so it minimizes the work we have. Steve making a terrace for berries. Terraces will prevent soil erosion and water loss. Digging holes to plant the berries. This is my son reading the instructions for the drip irrigation. Planet berries with drip irrigation system. Buffalo berries, choke cherries, and plums. My husband planted them like nature grafts them together. Berries after four months doing great. Watering my plants under the plastic cover that protects my plants from the wind and hail. Cucumbers are growing good, but we had to rig up a place for them to grow. Although they still grew, it was our last year to grow in such a small place. Onions grow very fast and grow well in our sheep mulch plot. Tomatoes doing great, but we did not grow them in this low tunnel. The next year, these also need to grow straight up. Beets and potatoes. High tunnel, getting the frame put up for the door. The frame and door usually don't come with the high tunnel. They are putting one up. Putting up the plastic covering on high tunnel. Volunteers came that day, and people from PBS who filmed me are also standing in the picture, too. The high tunnel is finished. Gothic high tunnel. My high tunnel is a Gothic high tunnel. It costs a little more, and is, it is a little more complicated putting it up, but it is very sturdy. The benefits of a high tunnel are it extends the growing season. In-ground crops are extended for longer periods of time. It protects crops from the cold, rain, hail, sleet, wind, and the sides roll up for ventilation. I can plant early in the season and harvest later in the fall. Plants grow faster also. Me with the workers from SDSU building raised beds for us. They used barrels and just cut them in half. Finishing them up. Workers made 24 raised beds. Here are the finished raised beds. This my starter plants getting ready for the high tunnel. I'm known for growing spices inside my house and starter plants. Once they grow, I can transfer them to my high tunnel and plant them in my raised beds. I'm saying a prayer giving thanks. Getting ready to plant more trees. Spring came and everyone helped out. Working after a long winter. I'm giving my plants some water, it was raining out. It already growing good and it grows fast. We are a Sundance family, so we had a Tree of Life Day in honor of the cottonwood tree. We planted 100 cottonwoods, now we are making that an annual day and we will plant every year. Friends and relatives came from Rapid City to help plant trees. This is my son and grandson planting trees. My grandchildren planting trees and having fun. Dwarf Alberta spruce and ash trees. Joey mountain ash. Digging holes for trees. My great granddaughter looking for plants. She looked and she got mad. 
Here I am in my hide tunnel. This is only June 2020. I got a lot of food out of my hide tunnel. We harvested until October. My blue corn grew tall. See how tall the corn was? It's like 14 feet. Molly goes wild on the farm. There's mint. These are all in the high tunnel. Parsley. Tomato. Jalapeno. Peppers. Eggplant. Radishes. My backyard now with trees we planted in my little greenhouse and high tunnel in the front yard. One of our goals is to save heirloom seeds and grow more of them each year. These are some of them I grew in my high tunnel. I in intend to plant 100 blue corn next year. Sweet grass. Sweet grass, mint, lavender are some of the indigenous plants I grow. The wild indigenous medicines and foods that grow on my land are onions. Wild turnips or chimpsila, mullein, echinacea, yucca, dandelion, burdock, sunflowers, chiaca, wild mint, sage, and we will be incorporating osha root and tamil, etc. With some chimpsila or turnip after harvested, it is used in soups and it is very healthy. Various trees around the high tunnel are there for a windbreak. Can, but food grows faster in a high tunnel and is protected from the climate. Trees and shrubs we planted. Some of the trees we planted are showy mountain ash, juniper pine, ponderosa pine, silver maple, red cedar, quaking trembling aspen, Swedish columnar aspen, Cottonwood, ash, dwarf Alberta spruce, red twigs, dogwood, fireside apple trees, mulberry trees, ninking cherry trees, blueberry trees, elderberry trees, buffalo berry, choke cherry, plum, lilacs, and wild rose bushes. In the spring, we will be planting more trees and we will be adding a bigger drip irrigation system to all the plants and trees. This is my grandson with vegetables from the garden. He picked you as part of my family. We learned a lot through this project and learned new skills. We hope by growing our own food, we can improve the quality of our lives and our families' lives and regenerate the land for future generations. Because of the pandemic, everything changed for us this past summer. We will finish our project in 2021, and we tried our best because it's all for our family's sustainability. So I hope you enjoyed this PowerPoint. Dokcha, okay.